to introduce Camilla Anderson from the School of Law and Desmond Ma, who is an artist involved with the project. Ladies and gentlemen, please make them welcome. Project Culture Jamming is for me a very unusual one. So I'm a lawyer. <laughs> Lawyers don't really get much involved in art except for intellectual property and other weird stuff. But over the last year and a half, I've had the great fortune to be involved in a visualization in law project. Um, and then when Desmond and I got together in relation to something that was maybe happening, um, we realized that we had a, a lot of things we could do together for something called culture jamming. Now, I'll put my hand up and say, a few months ago, I did not know what culture jamming meant. That is the nature of research. You're always learning. Um, but it's been a really exciting journey um, and a lot to talk about today. But for those of you who think that today is a political protest, there are two reasons why it's not. First of all, this is an academic presentation. Um, what we're doing is showcasing some of the visual art that has helped to culture jam a specific proposal. Uh, and secondly, there is no more need for a political protest. <laughs> um, yeah. it's, just, it's just so amazing, and what a fantastic day to be talking about this on. Thank you for those of you who come uh, to watch this. Uh, it's. <laughs> I just, uh, yeah, for once in my life, I'm rather speechless. Not a good time to be speechless, perhaps, um, but nevertheless, fabulous. So if I can get this clicker to work, here we go. So talking aloud, really, I've already done the fine print now, a fantastic platform to talk about things that we don't normally talk about, and especially as a lawyer, I really don't talk a lot about art. Um, but in the visualization project, I have learned a number of very important things about how lawyers are sometimes a bit too constrained in our choice of medium, uh, and how powerful visualization is. And this, for me, has been a whole new perspective on that. So just a few words about culture jamming, because stick your hand up if you'd ever heard that before. Oh, very educated audience of artists, fantastic. Um, so you probably all know more about it than I do. Uh, but what I found out was that culture jamming started in the 80s as a concept, graffiti and public visual arts, and how we could use the, the visual impressions of pop culture to try and influence different things about legislation and the way that society is developing. And with the arrival of the internet, oh my god, it has taken graffiti and changed it somewhat significantly into a different platform that is very alive, very publicly accessible, um, and extremely popular for a number of different things. Um, I love some of the quotes that people who are wiser in art than me have said about culture jamming, how it scrambles the signals um, and interjects the visual with the popular, with the unpopular, and helps to influence the mind. Wonderful ways of trying to encapsulate what it is. But what it is today is a collection of different visual impressions that have been happening throughout a specific movement. So culture jamming and politics have a long-standing relationship. Uh, politics is often influenced by culture jamming, as we've seen this morning at 9 a.m. Um, but also, politics is now beginning to be influencing culture jamming in its own way. We've seen a number of public elections that have been accredited to being won by memes, won by Facebook posts, the British election being the most recent example of how the youth has been encaptivated by a certain form of promotion. So there is a really interesting political relationship there that probably needs a lot more research and a lot more unraveling. Fascinating stuff, not what we're talking about today, really, but certainly worth thinking about. Um, so generally, uh, I'm just going to hand over to Desmond, who is um, an artist that I've had the privilege of working with briefly. Uh, do you want the microphone, Desmond? Uh, I think I can speak as well here. Yeah. yeah, but I don't think it'll go on yeah. film very well. So if you don't mind, just... Okay, hello. For the camera. All right, no worries. <laughs> so Desmond has a lot of experience with culture jamming, and he's the one that taught me what I know. Oh. So I'll hand over to him for a comment on that. Oh, sorry. So where do I put? Uh, here, right? All right, um, this is my earlier work that I did. Um, basically, I grew up um, in Singapore, 
and I moved over here during the 80s, right? When the 80s, when I was here, I was like, um, it was a culture shock for me because um, at that time, Chinese uh, wasn't welcome in Australia, especially Asians. So we were told to go home. So I, I struggled that a bit because I'm um, trying to say why am I not welcome, trying to understand the whole racial situation in, in Perth. So uh, I went, as I was in the art school, I started to think about using, um, embracing my culture and use that to make the, uh, contemporary art. So this work was made uh, during the, uh, during the time, um, I mean, when I made this work, I was referring to in koalas, because I was looking at a souvenir shop and saying, these koalas are so cute and nice, and they were about $2 each. So I thought, why don't I make my own version of koalas and paint it yellow and have them invading Australia. So yeah, so they have all their little identity. They, they are all very differently made um, because we, we, we tend to assume that all race the same and the stereotype. So I'm trying to like break away from that, trying to understand that. Okay, that's me in, in a box for two and a half hours filled with rice. Because I remember one of the nasty names I was given call, uh, was called rice stick or something like that. So I thought, well, why don't I play with that? I love eating rice anyway. So I was just sleeping the rice. And then, yeah, so I'm trying to make a performance with it. Okay, this work was made uh, last year uh, during Sculpture by the Sea. As you know, Cottesloe is a very popular w, um, tourism area. And uh, I thought, because of the sense of this uh, Muslim uh, rhetoric, you know, it's like a sense of like a deja vu for me because like what I, have, what I felt during the 80s is what the Muslims are <laughs> feeling now. So I thought, why do I make something that is culturally Chinese and have it placed in Cottesloe? Because I thought it would be interesting because this obviously was made to look like paper, like a paper origami, because I remember a string government says, all these asylum seekers who come to Australia can only enter with the right set of paper. So this is the paper man. <laughs> so I'll play a bit on the humor with my work. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So a bit of background there about culture jamming, which I first found really fascinating. Um, so let's move on to what brings us here today, namely the specific culture jamming that's happened around the Perth Mod relocation proposal, um, which threw a lot of people a um, bit of a curveball, as it were. So we're going to be looking at some of the things that uh, parents have been doing, some of the things that a professional artist like Desmond has been doing, but we're also going to be looking at some of the works of children. I have been blown away by the memes that our children have created. Um, we'll talk about those as they come along. Uh, if anyone here is easily offended, there'll be a warning sticker before the memes begin, so you have a moment to cover your eyes, because some of them are pretty hard-hitting. Not all of them factually true. That's part of the problem with some of this culture jamming, but we will talk about these as they pop along. So, is there anyone here in the room who would like a quick recap of the facts of what happened 42 days before the state election? I, yes, <laughs> there's one person, <laughs> that's fine. So 42 days before the state election happened, the, um, the Labour Party threw a bit of a curveball at the Perth Modern School, uh, saying that they were forcibly evict the students, put them in a different college in Northbridge in a high rise um, on the top floor of a multi-story building. Um, <clears throat> there had been no consultation with parents or schools, and after they were uh, elected to power, they claimed that this formed a mandate for them to continue to incorporate the uh, proposal into their actual politics. So a bit of a problem, and for many parents, a uh, cause for great concern. Um, there is a lot of merit to the idea of a specialist central school for gifted children, but there are also an awful lot of problems with the proposal as it was presented. Um, it's a very sensitive and very emotive issue for a number of different reasons. One of the reasons that's close to my heart is that gifted children are very special needs. Now, not all of them have the same problems in terms of anxiety or autism or positions on the spectrum, but the vast majority of gifted children are not the breeze that parents who don't have them think that they are. So I won't launch into a complex psychological exploration of twice exceptional children. Um, <laughs> suffice it to say that they are, they are to be treated with care and what we have at Perth Modern is a winning product 
who gives the children that unique environment that allows them to thrive and become productive citizens rather than what they might otherwise become without it. So it's a very dangerous thing to try and tackle, to try and touch. And I think that's one of the reasons why this has been such an emotive issue. This isn't just a relocation of a school. This is the relocation of special needs students who are gifted um, and who have found a unique formula to succeed. And that's what's made it so uh, obvious why there was a political backlash to this. So when I made these slides and sent them over last night, the government were rethinking. They have now finished rethinking, and I find it very difficult to get the smile off my face, as do many people in this room. So I think that's a fabulous success story. But I also think it's worth saying that I think it's a credit to any leadership that you throw an idea out there, you think outside the box, or inside the box, as one of the memes would suggest. Um, but when you do that, you then consult, you get the opinion of people, and then you're not too proud to say, well, maybe that wasn't such a good idea, let's rethink it. So this resistance, as I have perceived it, has never been about politics. It's about the difficult position that you put children into politics. So it's not about what party made what proposal and why that shouldn't work. It's about that specific um, position. So <clears throat> what has all this got to do with culture jamming? Well, a lot of fantastic visual work has come out of the political backlash that this proposal has resulted in. And it's been ex extremely powerful, some of it. A lot of my research touches upon the um, potential for visual images to have strong effects in law and in society and in different areas of contract law. Um, and what we have definitely seen is how powerful images have been in trying to evoke understanding politically. So, yeah. Are images stronger than words? Sometimes they can be. But you make up your minds at the end of this presentation. So just have a look at some of this. So first, a couple of various bits and pieces. I've tried to categorize these, um, but some of this is not easy to categorize because it's rather unique. First, the proposed bumper stickers. The work that went into these really interesting. Don't let the government blow up our past. So the stick of dynamite there, very emotive, I think. But my absolute favorite is the fly swatter, swatting out the inconvenient occupants of a, a school that the government wanted to take for local ch intake children. So, ooh, ouch, that one had to hurt. Uh, then we've got a photo shoot that was orchestrated by parents and children uh, where the children were demonstrating how they would feel in a high rise. I think there are very few things that can communicate quite as strongly um, the feeling of being encapsulated in a small high rise area, relying on elevators on the 27th floor as that. Is it manipulative to use children in your argument? Perhaps, but if this is something that affects the children, it is a manipulation that I would warrant potentially necessary. We've got a cartoon in the West. This one has made a number of people chuckle. <clears throat> I'm sure that I don't uh, recognize facial features enough to say who that lady represents. Um, it may or may not be an education minister, but certainly the cartoonist is adequately conveying the impression that the arguments for relocating into a high rise may not be particularly persuasive. And then on to a different kind of cartoon. Um, and this one was created by children and parents at Perth Modern. It's a comic strip of Education Central, or Edumacation Central, and it's been referred to by some. The idea is, of course, there is Mark McGowan's stand-in, having a great idea to relocate it. And I will repeat, I think there are some merits in the concept, it's just not the one that they put forward. Uh, they will love being in, or they will have fun playing in the lifts. And then the kids, with their little speechy bubbles, Seriously? Shock? Horror? Why do this? But what are we, we going to kick around our football? Let us be kids. And then Mark McGowan is considering the mandate that he has maybe to consult about more than just paint colors. And there's the argument that this is not only a risky thing to do to our children, but it's also ludicrously expensive in a time where the government has no money. No consultation, no choice. You've got your gagged parents there, some of which are in the room. Lovely to see you. Um, and then you've got that lovely, hmm, maybe I should be rethinking, the happy ending, the people's premier who will save Perth Modern. Um, and then that gratitude from the children. What a happy ending cartoon and how wonderful it is that it came true. So we do have a premier who listens and who reconsiders policies 
that may not fall on good favor. Lovely. Then we've got some pictures from the demonstration. I don't know whether any of you heard about the, the peaceful march from Perth Modern to the steps of Parliament. I'm sure some of you were there. Um, some beautiful pictures. We put together some collages that really encapsulate them. <laughs> so I consulted with my IP expert, and if something is in the public domain, I have a right to represent it as long as I say that I took it off the internet. And I took all of this off the internet. So if you see your children here and you did not give consent to that, you put them in the public space. <laughs> I got consent where I could, I recognize the children. But I'm loving the expressions on the kids' faces. I'm loving that, that very visual signal that it gives, uh, how engaged they are in, in communicating what they really don't like about this. Um, I'm loving the, the use of the emblem, the SOS acronym used for Save Our School. Um, but what I'm loving most is that sense of community that this very peaceful demonstration is conveying in these pictures. The feeling of coming together, to quietly and peacefully argue, this is not okay with us, and you need to rethink that. I think that's a very beautiful uh, feeling that you get from these pictures from that particular demonstration. Now let's move on to memes. <laughs> I will confess that the memes are the ones that have captured my imagination the most, aside from Desmond's fantastic <laughs> artwork, because they are so prolific. And some of them are so offensive, it makes my Danish soul curl up with joy. <laughs> and some of them are just so beautiful. Um, but the vast majority of these actually come from the kids. So I know that there are factual inaccuracies in these, but let's bear with this, they represent a perception. So does everyone know what the concept of a meme is? <coughs> the notion that you grab onto a popular notion in pop culture and then you give it a line that aligns with its persona? Um, yeah, this one I think, Dr. Evil, protecting the kids, love that one. And then here's two other very mainstream pop culture ones. Can you see it? Rich cat celebrating this ridiculous notion. And then the outrage, one does not simply trash Perth Modern or walk into Mordor or whatever. <laughs> then there are uh, these other ones. The top one is, is particularly angry. The notion that uh, rich kids are moving into our school. So the outrage is palpable there, I think, from a child's perspective. Then you've got that lovely Futurama. Yeah, seems legit. Uh, paying $15 million a year in rent for a school. Yeah, that seems like a great financial idea. Or not. And then the very simplistic notion. Uh, this is from one of our very uh, youngest children from year seven. Well, if kids are the future, which is what we're always being told, <coughs> And why do they want to trash the one place that gives us that future? Why do they want to put it in the past? Powerful but simple message. I love this one. <laughs> this one's from a parent who shall remain nameless. It was delivered to me in an email, so it wasn't taken off the internet, but I love it. Um, and it really sums up how parents might feel about their children being put in an aluminium box on the 27th floor. This one is very offensive. The notion that um, it's built on a, a propaganda film that was running around Scandinavia where they were making fun of the way we treat the elderly in Scandinavia by having uh, very poor people in Africa comment on whether or not Scandinavia needed foreign aid to help the way that we treat our elderly. So it's latching onto that same concept. Do we really have to put people in high rises in schools in Perth? Well, uh, no. Do they need foreign aid, these poor people in Perth? So very offensive, I know, but still a powerful, thought-provoking image. This one's from Harry Potter. I love this one. It's a reworking of Dolores' Umbridge's declarations. If you've seen the film, you'll know the wall where she puts all these framed declarations on things you can and cannot do in education. And this one uh, it prohibits students from going outdoors, which is effectively <laughs> what Education Central would be doing in the eyes of who drafted this beautiful meme. Then we've got two more memes, very, very different. One of them is a comic strip. And this one is probably the most political. What should we do to get votes? Evict kids, take the school land, that'll get votes. Get the local elective on board. Let's just lie about everything. I think that's the go-to uh, humorous politician's attitude. And then this one guy says, why don't we save Perth Modern? 
He's instantly thrown out the window. No. <laughs> and then the other one. Now, this other one is interesting because it caused a lot of controversy when it was posted on the internet. I happen to know the background of this one very well uh, because I was in the room when the crowd of girls put it together. They did a lot of research to find a developing country with huge economic growth and investment in infrastructure. They found Bangladesh because there were some online policies on green spaces in schools and urban environments in Bangladesh, which ensured that all schools and urban environments in that country have access to playing fields and lots of green space. And then they contrasted that with the government's plan for Perth Modern by finding what I think is one of the bleakest high-rise pictures <laughs> available in public domain. And then they put up this particular uh, picture meme. It is potentially very <laughs> offensive. I get that. But I think it evokes a very powerful, thought-provoking message that if developing countries prioritize green spaces for children, what on earth is making us think it's not important for us? <sighs> and speaking of offensive, <laughs> and I apologize for equating um, a relocation of students to the loss of millions of homes in the Ukraine. Um, but it's obviously tempting, too tempting not to use this in this particular presentation. Very offensive. You saw the warning at the other slide, I know. But uh, yay, well done, Mark. Just grab that land. <coughs> A few more. Perth Modern, beautiful uh, picture of the grounds, the greenery, the fantastic historical buildings. And Mark going, yeah, children thrive there. Let's kill it. Nice contrast. Hmm. And then, of course, we move straight on to the matrix. Does anyone remember the beautiful speech by Morpheus on how the big nuclear apocalypse started? So the drama in children's minds of, of equating the, the relocation of their school to a nuclear post-apocalypse caused by machines. Wow, how emotive is that? We don't know who started the war, but we know that it was us that put schools in skyscrapers. <laughs> mm. who, would to take, who would want to take responsibility for that decision on seeing that meme? Finally, <laughs> this one a late entry to the program, but an absolute delight I felt when I saw it on Facebook, um, and I got permission from the author to use it. Um, Robin going, um, and what about Injubication Central? And then Batman just giving him a proper bitch slap. <laughs> Say Perth Modern, Robin, stop that nonsense. I love it. I think it's amazing. So memes, you can love them or you can hate them. And some people hate them, and for good reason. And there are many factual inaccuracies in here. Some are saying that the school is being closed down. Some are seeing themselves as being forcibly evicted and forced into something akin to poverty, when really the vision was to create a very expensive STEM school for them. But it doesn't matter about the accuracy. What matters is the perception, and also the perception that it passes on. Memes are a powerful tool. And they are uncensored, uncontrolled, and they are out there. Do we need to be careful about what we put out there? Of course, but you could say the same thing about words or anything else. Um, but there are certainly a force to be reckoned with, I think. A couple of more examples of non-memes that kids have created, some beautiful artwork. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> I love that picture. Oh, very young children getting engaged in artwork. <laughs> and some beautiful representations of, of the driving forces behind the protestations against the relocation. And I also particularly love this one, the likening of the high-rise to the Tower of Sauron, the early drawings by, um, I, can I reveal who created this? By a two-year-old girl. No, two year two. Oh, year two, oh, sorry. I was really impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that destroys the sensationalism a little bit. So a seven-year-old girl. So, still pretty good for a seven-year-old. But also that, that that metaphor, you know, the Tower of Sauron, that, that huge towering evil, um, it personified that high-rise. I mean, that high-rise has had a lot to answer for in the public image and in the public mind. And as I said, not all of it fair, but certainly all of it very evocative. Uh, I don't know where this uh, sketch came from with the uh, original proposal for the Education Central being amended, but it was in the public space, so I nabbed it. And what I really like about it is that it actually goes in and engages with the inaccuracies of the artist's drawing in a very uh, factual way. 
So the fact that the green space on the roof, in itself rather alarming, is in fact a quarter of the size of just the oval alone of the school grounds. Very worrying. Um, the representation of the green parkland uh, across the railroad on Northbridge, also grossly inaccurate. Um, so yeah, I like this one. It's a, it's a very factual, very pragmatic representation. Um, and then we were really lucky this morning, and thank you to the parent who dropped these off, to have the actual costumes. Uh, these are costumes that children created. Uh, children sit inside them, their little eye holes, and then they walk around as high-rise buildings protesting the, uh, the high-rise itself. So yeah, how emotive is this stuff, guys? If, if yeah, I think it's pretty amazing. So I will um, hand over now to Desmond, who will talk about his art. And we're very lucky he's got two beautiful paintings to talk about uh, in the room. OK, um, there was a proposal that I wanted to install in Perth Modern. When I heard about the proposal to relocate um, Perth Modern, I was shocked. Um, because I have taught uh, for a number of years in Singapore, actually taught in a top school. And a proposal like Perth Modern will never uh, get approval from the school in Singapore because Singaporeans, are, uh, they value the tradition, you know, especially academically select students, all right? So I thought that um, when Mark proposed to move the school, I felt that there was a clear disrespect for the tradition and the culture of the school. So I have this idea of like, creating Mark McGowan like a uh, public monument saying uh, loser to Perth Modern. So that uh, was my initial proposal. Then I thought to myself, where am I going to get the funding to build something like that? And, and even, <laughs> yeah, I might have to beg for the government from or uh, even to get the school to approve things like that. So we, there was lots of um, ideas. Maybe we should like sneak in, in the middle of the night and just have it installed, you know, or have it run like a, a political billboard um, uh, on, a, on, a, on a trailer and just move around. So that was... <laughs> yes, yes. And, and, and the thing is that I made a mistake. I stuck my head out during the um, per modern meeting. I'm saying I'm the artist. I shouldn't have said that. I probably will get away with doing things like that. Okay, so I've, I did a brainstorm, so I thought maybe I should do something that's small but yet significant because um, I think this is an issue that concerns, I would say, I wouldn't say in the whole of Western Australia, but like kids who are going to Perth Modern. So I thought maybe I should make the work smaller and more detailed. So this work was based on the idea of using Chinese landscape painting because when I, when I look at Chinese landscape painting, they don't have conversations. It's just landscape, people looking at each other. I thought maybe I can subvert it and make it more interesting. So what I did is, um, I painted uh, a more, uh, use an image of the tower of um, the dark tower in Lord of the Rings. You guys can see in the background the eye of all seeing. So the, the and then some images of forced relocation. This you can't see very clearly here because it's resin work. Yeah. So yeah. So you can see that in the middle of the painting you can see some images of um, people being persecuted because of their intellect. Yeah, so then there's Mark McGowan saying loser, and then there's some like graffiti on the monument in, in Perth Modern. And then there's some secret handshakes. Maybe there's some secret uh, deals going on, we don't know. Yeah. So the other one I, I came up with was called What Do You Do When You Have a Mandate? So the whole idea of this work is um, um, reference to Walking Dead. Okay, you can see one of the Walking Dead people at the back. And there's Sue Ellery as a, um, as a demon and trying to kill Per Morden. And then here uh, on the left hand side, you can see um, the gods uh, delivering the verdict. We have the mandate to do whatever we want. So in, to me, it's just like an empty paper. Okay? There's no approval. Nobody approves things like that. Okay? Then you can see a smurf persecuting um, the inter uh, kids who are in that context. Obviously, all this didn't happen. So the whole thing of this is a bit like a nightmare situation when you wake up from a terrible nightmare. Yes, it's just a nightmare. Yep. So just quickly recap. Yep, that's it.
uh, that UWA will be uh, displaying these beautiful works of art that Desmond has created specifically uh, for this presentation at the Alva Gallery. Um, we're not quite sure when <laughs> or how, but we'll get them up the wall in there. Um, it'll certainly come together. So we encourage you to come and have a look at them afterwards. They're very detailed, 3D, intricate. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Desmond. It's been fantastic. Um, before I move on to my concluding remarks, just a couple of things about culture jamming and famous people. Because we live in a very strange world <coughs> where famous people have an inordinate amount of, uh, of influence. Maybe that's not strange. Maybe that's the human nature. I've watched a, a Marvel film where Loki would posit that we wish to follow but that's perhaps an irrelevant aside. What is interesting is that we have had a lot of influential people uh, trying to uh, pitch in with their views. And what really fascinated me was in this world of memes, one of the most influential people were not the prominent QCs and politicians uh, who got on board in the debate. It was this young lady. <laughs> Now, if you don't know who she is, then I don't know where you've been for the past few months, because this is Catherine Langford, star of Netflix's 13 Reasons Why. Now, the reason why I think she's worth mentioning in this context is because she has 5.4 million followers on Instagram, which I'm given to believe is 5.398 more than Mark McGowan. So when she posts something about trying to make sure that her old school is safeguarded, when she distributes some of the memes that she finds, she gets a lot more people's attention. Now, I have an opinion about that. In this particular context, it's been helpful to a cause which I may or may not have been secretly supporting. As a state employee, I can't divulge my opinions on that issue, but I think they're pretty apparent. But is it really right that a young very beautiful and obviously very intelligent actress has such a strong political influence because she has so many followers because of her fame. <coughs> I don't know. Isn't that an interesting thing? Combine that with the power of the memes and the obvious inaccuracies in some of them, and I think we have something rather explosive which we as a society might need to examine a little bit more closely when we weigh up the information that we receive. Um, but yeah, fabulous young lady. Um, and if, if you don't realize here she is out of uniform, she was actually given an infringement for being out of uniform, very humorous. <laughs> Thank you. So just a quick conclusion. Um, this culture jamming, it's clearly very effective. Should it be? Well, I'll leave that to you to decide. Um, it clearly has been in this particular movement, and it is no secret that it is of great joy to most people in this room that it has been so effective. But it certainly has been incredibly interesting. If politicians are now trying to influence us with memes and tweets, at least we get to influence back. So on that note, I leave you just with one thought. We may have won the battle in terms of this particular proposal, but the war is about making sure that children are kept out of politics. This fight hasn't stopped. Assurances need to be given that politics <coughs> and education policies are kept much more distinctly apart. So not to end on a negative note, but thank you.